Just good afternoon. Uh, good morning, uh, depending on where in the world you are. Uh, welcome everyone to the last panel of the day, last panel of the conference, actually. Uh, my name is Brian Eford. Um, I'm a program director at CAPSARC in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and also the deputy Sherpa of the T20, the Think 20, which is an engagement group for the G20. Um, and I have the privilege to kick off this final panel um, focused on issues of, of trade and I think challenges um, that uh, both are impacted by trade and may be uh, uh, resolved hopefully by um, uh, improving how trade uh, trade flows happen in, in, in and around the world. Um, and I guess just to frame this panel just a little bit, um, we're, we're quickly approaching the end of the Saudi presidency of the G20. Um, and uh, you know, upcoming will be a, a, the, the Think 20 Summit, the G20 Summit, and then the handoff to the Italian presidency um, uh, you know, uh, around the end of the year. Um, and, and one of the main issues that, one of the big issues that has been discussed uh, this year, um, maybe not uh, uh, incredibly well publicized, but certainly very important is the issue of trade. Um, and we have three very distinguished and excellent panelists who are going to uh, talk about this issue uh, over the course of the next hour or so. Um, and, and I think kind of the common theme that binds the presentations together is, again, this, this interrelationship between uh, a number of global challenges that, that uh, uh, trade is, is interrelated to, uh, uh, intricately interrelated to. Um, and uh, we'll be able to take questions at the end. I think what we'll do is, is go through each of the talks. They'll be around uh, uh, 10 to 12 minutes. Um, and then after the talks are complete, um, we'll take questions from the audience and, and hopefully have um, as best as possible in this virtual forum, a lively discussion. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to jump right into the speakers um, and we'll go in order of the program. So uh, first, it's my privilege to introduce to you Ike Lim. He's the Director of Trade and in the Environment Division at the World Trade Organization. And I'll turn it over to, to Ho. Uh, uh, now the mic is yours. Thanks, thanks very much, Brian, and thanks very much, you know, to to the British Institute for International Comparative Law, and also to Julinda, for the invitation to join this um, this conference. Now, I, I think for what I'll speak upon uh, it is a topic that you know concerns us all. COVID nineteen, we're all in in the midst of the pandemic, um, and try to to link this this challenge of COVID nineteen to to another challenge, sustainable trade and ask this question about, you know, how can we do better or how can we build back better, as some people have said. Um, and, and I think this gives us an, an opportunity to get into this discussion of three, I, I from my perspective, three very pressing challenges um, that we face um, between health, environment and development, and all three are interrelated. I haven't mentioned trade because I think trade is, is something that connects all three of these areas. And, and the question here is how do we uh, better use trade? Uh, I mean, I'm start with some things which everyone knows, of course, is that, you know, COVID-19, originally a health crisis, uh, now morphed also into a global economic crisis. Um, it has severe impacts on livelihoods. Um, and many also look at COVID-19 as, as a problem of the environment. Um, you know, many have argued that environmental degradation, biodiversity, habitat loss, climate change, uh, make zoonotic outbreaks like COVID-19 uh, actually more frequent and, and more common. And ask the question, is this the future that we will be experiencing? And if it is climate related, uh, what about the bigger question of the climate? How are we addressing this challenge? Um, so I think that this panel will probably help us think through some of these questions. For my part, I'll, I'll look at it in terms of perspective of trade and sustainable trade. In terms of the, the wider impacts, um, you know, WTO has issued many different uh, estimates of global trade and the decline in global trade. Um, some of these figures suggest something like 10% decline in this year. Um, and FDI is also going down. We expect a decrease from UNCTAD, who gives an estimate of 40% uh, for 2020. And behind all of these figures, you know, apart from trade and investment, is 
are, are people, essentially. So what we're talking about is an economic crisis. Uh, expectations is that it will push maybe 500 million, maybe more into poverty. Uh, it will be the first increase in poverty rates globally uh, in decades. And it also will have an effect on, on things like food and, and food security, food starvation may all go up. So why do I highlight this? I think it's to come back to your original point is that there's a relationship here between global challenges and, and, and trade and particularly how can we use trade as a tool uh, to, to meet these challenges. And also at the same time, as you've said, trade in itself has a challenge in terms of how can it become more sustainable. Very immediately, uh, of course, at the top of most governments' minds will be how do they respond to the crisis? Um, and responding to this crisis will mean also uh, economic responses, such as uh, massive injections of capital uh, to support recovery. And, and this, I think, is a critical point, a critical inflection point, because depending on how this capital is used and how it's injected and into what, um, this can either make building back uh, sustainably and more in a more resilient way, easier or, or harder. So, so let me focus a little bit on, on that point and, and try to link it to, to trade. I think there are going to be four very broad uh, policy directions that governments will are taking and have been taking and will continue to take. Uh, one is clearly stimulate jobs, uh, job creation, uh, in that also safeguarding jobs. Um, and here there will be a related dimension on looking at activities that could have a high multiplier effect, uh, significant growth potential. Uh, there will also be a need to do, let's call it rescue spending to help sectors that have been severely affected and, and to restore those sectors. And what's also been very uh, evident to us, and this is very clear for a trade uh, audience, is the, the impact of COVID-19 on the robustness and resilience of supply chains. So questions here about how can trade be more robust and, and more resilient, and how can we ensure that the goods and services that we all need from food, medicines, medical equipment, and so forth, uh, can withstand these types of shocks. So I think at the, at the first general level, trade is going to have a, a clear relationship to, to, to all of this. But the challenge is not just about rebooting the international trade engine. It's actually about finding pathways if we want to be addressing global challenges, about finding pathways to let's call it sustainable trade, uh, trade that can help both environment and economy. And, and what are some of these pathways? Um, so let me venture into maybe six or seven ideas. Uh, not, they're, they're by no means my ideas. These are ideas that have been floating around for quite some time. Uh, some of them have been debated in the, in the WTO, in the Committee on Trade and Environment. Some of them are taken up by different groups of members or individually by members. One which is uh, very trade related is uh, a pathway to facilitate trade in environmental goods and services to support clean technology dissemination. As I said, it's not a new route, uh, but I think it's one that, that should be revisited. Uh, look at what's happening in renewable energy. Uh, the IEA, uh, International Energy Agency, very recently issued a report which basically tells us that you know, solar electricity is perhaps the cheapest thing out there at the moment. Um, and that uh, new and renewable power capacity has outpaced fossil fuel for, for the past seven years. And if we look at the job side, uh, there's great growth potential for jobs in this sector. Uh, it's already 11 million jobs, and it could potentially increase in the future. So how can trade contribute to this momentum? Uh, one thing which is very much trade, which is reducing tariffs. Um, can WTO members look at reducing, cutting tariffs on a broad range of environmental goods that could lead to carbon emissions reductions? Um, there are some estimates there that suggest that even though the tariffs may not be very high, it, it's still a contribution when we look at things like renewable energy uh, related goods. Um, I won't go through figures because of, of the amount of time, it's not long, uh, but I think that's the one, one big pathway. 
uh, and is very much within the WTO competence, uh, removing barriers to trade in, in green goods and services, uh, to put it uh, briefly. Has work been done on this already? Yes. I mean, there were efforts within the Doha round uh, through the environmental goods related negotiations. And then there was a plurilateral by a group of 46 WTO members working towards an environmental goods agreement. Unfortunately, they, they did not succeed at that time. 2016 was when the, the negotiations were more or less, let's say, suspended. Um, but the framework is still there. There's still a possibility to come back to it, provided that there's the political will and that the members wish to come back to this. And many of these goods are, are goods that are increasingly well known, you know, as I said, solar, wind, geothermal energy equipment, insulation materials for energy efficient buildings smart grids, weather forecasting instruments. So they're very concrete things that we can look at and can think about how do we further disseminate these goods by making them cheaper. Another pathway, uh, and it's very related of course, is to think about scaling up green businesses. And some of them will use environmental goods and services. Some of them produce environmental goods and services. Uh, and here it's a, again, a, a very much a growing sector. Uh, the Business and Sustainable Development Commission uh, estimates that, you know, um, business opportunities, sustainable business opportunities here uh, could reach something like US dollar 12 trillion uh, by 2020. So even if you're looking at this from a business perspective and not primarily from a sustainability perspective, that there's an opportunity here. And we also know that trade by linking up markets uh, is another way to scale up. So uh, we can use the trade instrument to scale up green business opportunities and scaling this up again can help create more jobs. And there, there are many different estimates here about, you know, uh, how many jobs could be created. But I think that the, the main point is that it's a, it's a growth sector. And with growth sectors, you know, you can expect more jobs created over the next few decades. Um, a third pathway, and I think we need to recognize this, is, is, is challenges of capacity. Um, not all countries uh, are currently able or sufficiently able to make that transition to all those things I talked about, you know, be it in terms of shifting their energy production to, to, to greener technologies or to take advantage of opportunities by emerging green economy. So I think we need to recognize that, that, that there are capacity gaps and there are challenges. And these are in terms of skill, supply, um, infrastructure, or, or even as concrete as ability to, to meet environmental regulatory requirements and upgraded standards. So in order to build back better and to make this a, a, a more global effort, um, you know, certain regions or let's say developing uh, countries will need investment and assistance uh, to better meet these sustainability goals. And this can be very concrete again, it's in terms of export diversification, improving productive capacity, channeling investments into climate resilient infrastructure, helping to upgrade quality infrastructure and so forth. WTO has a few instruments, and, but I think there are many more than what WTO has. I mean, WTO has aid for trade in collaboration with international organizations, it has the enhanced integrated framework for least developed countries, it's got the standards and trade development facility. And, and I think apart from looking at the instruments, it's about this wider shift of uh, can these instruments be used um, with a focus on, on more sustainability and more sustainable trade without creating conditionality, which has been very difficult for, for many developing countries. Um, so uh, this could be a, a part of a green economic recovery. Fourth one, and I think we, we, for all of us who work in trade, I think we do need to recognize it is difficult, it is challenging conversation, but I think we do need to recognize that uh, we also need to look about improving the environmental footprint of trade itself. Uh, this could be in terms of reducing emissions, pollution, waste, and so forth, uh, and how to adapt to cleaner technologies, improve waste management, build more circular economies, and when I say we, I, I think a lot of this will be on the private sector. Um, but of course, governments play a, a big uh, role in providing that framework. 
and some of these policies to improve the environmental footprint of trade may actually not really be within the competence of WTO or trade policies. Um, uh, it may be saying something strange, but at the end of it, it's about a global effort across many different sectors. Um, another key area that WTO, of course, has a, has a, will have a, a big role and really has a role in is about strengthening mechanisms for trade and environmental governance. Um, uh, we have at WTO, the WTO Committee on Trade and Environment. It's a fairly unique institution uh, uh, for WTO members to meet and to discuss these challenges. It's possibly the only multilateral forum uh, that allows this, this sort of dialogue. And the question here would be, it's member driven again, and how can members actually use this uh, committee uh, more effectively? And, and to do so, they will need to break down some silos between trade ministry, environment ministry, and other ministries that are, are all part of sustainable trade. Uh, so the forum is there, the opportunity is there, uh, what's needed is uh, perhaps the vision, political will, uh, motivation to actually move ahead uh, in this. And I think we shouldn't get, I mean, with respect to all the lawyers, since this is Bickle, um, but I would say we shouldn't get too much trapped into a legal discussion about improving trade and environmental governance. It's very important, but I think there's still a lot of things that can be done, which are within the scope of things like the Committee on Trade and Environment. And there are things going forward. Uh, we will be having a, a, a WTO Trade and Environment Week, so to speak, um, the week of 16 November, where the committee will be meeting and there'll be a range of activities by, by members themselves. Why do I highlight this? It's because the, the amount of energy that some members, and it was quite, there's a growing number of members that are putting behind these activities are starting to grow. There's a, a group called Friends Advancing Sustainable Trade. They're, they're looking at building support for environmental sustainability in trade, but there are also other ideas such as how to address plastics pollution, how to address the circular economy, there's been a, a, a declaration for some time on fossil fuel subsidy reform. Uh, some members are keen on looking at greening aid for trade. So there's an agenda here. Um, still nascent, still evolving, but there, there is something interesting developing. Um, and, and lastly, um, making supply chains more resilient to risks and shocks, um, not only environmentally, but but basically essentially ensuring that you know, goods continue to flow. Um, crisis has uh, underscored the independence of uh, interdependence of economies. And here, uh, you know, there may be different views. Some feel that these shocks mean reshoring. Some uh, believe it's about going more nationally. I, I would say that doesn't work, that closing borders, protectionism, deglobalization, does not improve, does not increase resilience. It actually weakens uh, countries um, and that we need to think through these problems in a more cooperative way. So I know I've probably, probably taken too much time, but let me finish on that point uh, and, and say that I think that's what links us all here on this panel, which is to find cooperative and collaborative efforts to address global challenges and to look at the contribution that trade can make. So, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ho. Um, uh, very interesting presentation. Raised a number of, I think, points that that hopefully we can pick up again in the uh, the Q and A at the end. But kind of a tour de force of uh, the uh, I don't know. For me, every every time there's a challenge, there's also an opportunity. And COVID nineteen is no different. Um, at a time where I was seeing the kind of atomization of the global economy, um, reinforcing the need for kind of co cooperation and multilateralism. Um, you know, in particular, uh, the ability to build back better, whether it's in terms of the greening of industry or the focus on logistical supply chains and their ability to support trade, whether in a less environmentally intensive way or in a more resilient way. Um, and even focusing on the, the idea of the need for a development assistance to try to even out the ability of the developing world to take advantage of this opportunity as well. So yeah, large number of issues that you touched on. Um, 
but rather than jump into them now, um, we have another excellent panelist uh, ahead of us. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, John Eves Remy. Uh, she's the, Dr. John Eves Remy, she's the Deputy Director of the SRC for International Trade Law Policy and Services at the University of the West Indies. Um, and also uh, uh, quite an early riser in order to join us on this panel. So uh, thank you for that. Um, and uh, with great pleasure, uh, turn over the mic to you to, to hear what you have to say about the topic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Brian. Is everyone able to hear me? Okay. I want to start by thanking Bickle and the session organizers for the invitation, which I accepted in spite of the fact that it, yes, did deprive me of some sleep. But as the sun rises here in this beautiful part of the world, I realize that it's probably never too early to proselytize on an issue for me that is more than just a negotiating item, but represents an existential issue for countries in my part of the world, the Caribbean. I very much, before I start, I very much endorse the spirit of Hold's um, sort of intervention, which is for us to think really creatively beyond the legalism and beyond thinking about what can't be done into a new phase of thinking about how the WTO and other such organizations can be more responsive to the real needs of real people. I want to begin my remarks with what might be considered a depressing observation made by Professor Alan Winters at the beginning of a piece he wrote entitled, What do small and poor developing countries need from the multilateral trading system? And he said, the participation of small and poor developing countries in multilateral trade negotiations has given rise to a plethora of analyses and polemics about what can, should, might be agreed, and implicitly whose fault it will be when agreement is not reached. He said it is neither an attractive nor a particularly constructive position to be in, and certainly not one that fills the independent observer with much hope, end of quote. Truth be told, small states, which are the subject of my discussion here, present something of a conundrum for the trade community. First, while trade theory insists that they stand to gain most from trade liberalization and open economies, politically, their small size means that they have very little bargaining power as members of a club defined by the sacred tenets of non-discrimination and reciprocity. Second, small states have inalienable and unalterable characteristics from which they can never really graduate and which make scale in economic terms almost impossible to reach. Third, while it is clear that accommodating small countries' concerns would make a marginal change to overall trade patterns, they do not receive the same treatment under trade rules as, for instance, least developed countries, LDCs. In the same piece quoted above, Professor Alan Winters stated that granting anything to small countries would be unlikely to be disruptive. Overall, LDCs, he said, and small economies account for less than 1% and less than 0.25% of world GDP, respectively, and 1% and 0.4%, respectively, of world exports. End of quote. In some ways, the realities of small states should make it relatively simple for the global community to respond with alacrity and decisiveness to their needs. And yet the evidence is that this has not been their experience and certainly not at the WTO. While small states have vociferously articulated their special concerns across multiple fora, it is fair to say that they have not been met with the commensurate receptiveness that they deem appropriate. Part of the reason I would hazard, or indeed the evidence of that hesitancy, lies in the WTO's failure to expressly recognize them as a bona fide negotiating group. While some entities like the Commonwealth Secretariat have an express mandate for this cohort and define small states as sovereign states with a population size of 1.5 million people or less, 
the WTO has not really gone that far. Instead, it has given limited and I would say almost schizophrenic recognition to an informal grouping called the Small and Vulnerable Economies or the SVEs, comprising around 25 self-defined countries, which are inherently defined by characteristics such as physical isolation, distance from main markets, minimal shares of trade, low productivity, inability to diversify production, high transport costs, and difficulties in attracting foreign investment, and ultimately low competitiveness. At the Doha Ministerial Conference, a work program was established to, quote, frame responses to the trade-related issues identified for the fuller integration of SBEs into the multilateral trading system under the supervision of the Committee of Trade and Development, but with the express directive that this should not thereby create a subcategory of states. So traditionally, SVEs have rallied around core issues alone or as part of broader subgroupings. And they've tried to frame them as defensive or offensive negotiating demands. These include participation constraints due to limited human technical and financial resources, high trade costs that impede their ability to reach and access markets, difficulty in implementing obligations under the SBS, TBT, and TRIPS agreements, erosion of preferences in traditional markets of the EU and the US, for example. Um, and after several years of regulation and mobilization of tremendous resources, they have found some, albeit piecemeal success, through inclusion of flexibilities in existing agreements and negotiating texts. But it would really be foolhardy to believe that the problems of small states integration is amenable to one-off fixes. I would hazard that a more deep-seated and entrenched accommodation and acceptance in the very rules, almost as a level of principle, is needed. The multilateral trade agenda is not static. It is ever-evolving, expanding, and constantly being overloaded with issues of direct concern to all states, including small ones. Issues such as food security, climate change, and trade finance are gaining more and more prominence in the WTO. And in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, vulnerabilities of all countries, but in particular small states, are exposed. So what are these issues for which small states want more meaningful engagement? A glimpse at recent statements in councils and WTO committees provides us with some clues. First, small states have rejected a United States recent proposal to use rigid characterizations such as GNI per capita as a basis for determining developed country status, since according to small states, that measure one targets many of them, which are World Bank classified as high income, to deviate from self-declaration as a basis for developing country eligibility, and three, undermines their long-held view that gauging a country's inherent vulnerabilities are a better determinant of whether and how they are able to deal with trade shocks and therefore whether they should find special accommodation under WTO rules. Second, Small states are arguing for a clear prioritization at the WTO of issues such as climate change, trade and natural disasters, attracting sustainable investments, impact of exogenous shocks, as is the case with COVID-19, as well as growing knowledge of their trade vulnerabilities in WTO discussions. Third, Small states have taken definitive positions in specific negotiations, including in fishery subsidies negotiations, where they are calling for greater transparency and inclusiveness in small group discussions, inclusion in the negotiating text of exemptions for government expenditure and measures used to prepare for, relieve, or recover from damage caused by climatic, natural, and man made disasters. In agriculture, a recognition that while small, the sector remains vital to supporting national income, rural livelihoods, food and nutrition security, and government accounts, 
and that any outcome in the text should permit enhanced flexibilities and adequate policy space to facilitate the development participation and more meaningful integration into global trade. Simplification of transparency and notification requirements to take into account of technical and financial capacity constraints. On the newer issues, such as the JSI issues, small states note that while the expanding negotiating agenda makes part their participation difficult, they can ill afford to sit these negotiations out and not attempt to at least steer the agenda towards issues of interest to them. So for instance, in the e-commerce discussions, CARICOM, the Caribbean community, has stated that COVID-19 has really exposed how critical digital transformation has become to the survival and future of our economies and has called for a refocus from a moratorium to issues relating to the digital divide. On the reform agenda, small states continue to support efforts to resurrect the appellate body and their support for the DSM, the dispute settlement mechanism, comes even though some have argued that the DSM has underdelivered for them. Of the nearly 600 cases brought so far, only two have been brought to date by small states. Finally, small states are strategically using the platform of the WTO to shed light on issues of fairness they see arising from tactics by larger countries, even issues that formally fall outside the WTO mandate. So just last week, CARICOM countries called on some members to end the quote, continued unilateral, arbitrary, and non-transparent blacklisting strategy, particularly at a time of unprecedented global uncertainty. While noting that the WTO's lack of standing per se on the matter, CARICOM member states use the pulpit to request that WTO members engage in more effective consultations before blacklisting, reconsider the rigidity of the methodology used to blacklist, be more transparent in the methodology, and have discussions with targeted countries to agree on mitigating measures before blacklisting. So small states have been marking their territory in ongoing discussions at the WTO, thereby putting the lie to claims I have heard that their demands have not been clearly articulated. In that spirit, I want to end on a more constructive note than the one I started with, which does not leave the fate of small states entirely in the hands of others, but seeks to constructively add to the stockpile of solutions being offered to address their needs. Small states have for a long time called for the use of a vulnerability index as a complement or alternative to GDP per capita as a basis for allocating resources and providing grants and concessional funding by IFIs and other donor agencies. These calls have grown louder since COVID-19 exposes the precarity and fragility of our economies. I'm not going to list figures here, but for some of the smaller economies, for instance, entirely dependent on tourism, the effect of these the pandemic has been catastrophic. In fact, in March um, this year, the G20 trade ministerial statement demonstrated that it appreciated the challenge of small states when it stated that we are concerned about the impact of COVID-19 on vulnerable developing and least developed countries, notably in Africa and small island states. At my institution, the SRC, we have argued that a vulnerability index could have utility at the WTO to help quantify and measure all countries' relative vulnerabilities, specifically using data from multiple sources that index and rank vulnerabilities along economic, environmental, health, and institutional dimensions 
and can serve as a guide to determining the kind of trade and trade-related assistance that may be needed to overcome these vulnerabilities and ultimately build resilience. While not confined to small states, I could see a clear application of a vulnerability index to trade issues that confront small states. For instance, as an alternative to GDP per capita, to craft rules that might apply in the future when dealing with supply constraints for goods like PPE, to address shortages of countries with limited resources and opportunity for diversification, to guide the priorities for technical assistance and trade financing, to respond to natural disasters, and as Holim said, invest in renewable energy ventures, to determine eligibility for special rates by entities such as the ACWL in dispute settlement, which currently uses GDP per capita to determine how countries um, are able to access their services to deal with the human and capacity constraints and vulnerabilities that render small states very difficult to adhere to notification and transparency obligations under the WTO. Finally, we can find solutions to the problems of small states. But I would propose that it has to begin with an embracement of the fact that they face peculiar issues that deserve special attention. And while they are not unique in having unique problems, the problems that they face are identifiable, specific, and very unlikely to change. Small states serve as a reminder to the global conscience that countries are not all alike. Some will find it harder than others to participate in the multilateral trading system. To hold on to rules and attitudes out of fear that reconsidering them inevitably leads to opening floodgates, in my view, is cowardly and shirks our collective responsibility to find solutions that all WT members can live with and that can promote lasting and sustainable outcomes for all. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you very much, John Eves. Uh, very interesting uh, uh, discussion. Um, brings out a couple points, I think, shifting again the focus to this asymmetry between the opportunities and challenges between large economies and the developing world, especially, I think this is an important point in the context of the G20. Um, you know, brought up points like uh, the recognition that the bargaining power of small countries in defining the rules of the game is quite different than that of large countries. Um, not letting us forget that the individual and collective impact of uh, focusing on small countries on the global economy shouldn't be a, a, something to dissuade us from lifting up the developing world. Um, and I think even in the context of the pandemic, um, the kinds of risks and impact of crises and the way it differently affects small countries like the, in the global south, for example, um, as opposed to the developed world. And, and finally, I think maybe some optimism that the importance of the WTO as an institution that can be used to highlight and support these kinds of issues facing small states in the global south. So um, I think a nice kind of continuation of the discussion that was started by Ho in the first talk. So thank you very much for that. Um, and that brings us to the third and final talk. But last but not least, of course, um, Phil Bloomer. Um, uh, he's the executive director of the Business and Human Rights Resource Center. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Phil. Uh, Phil, the mic is yours. Thanks very much, Brian. Um, so first, a big thanks, obviously, to the British Institute for International Comparative Law and also to Jolinda for organising this session. Last month, the G20 Trade and Investment Ministers said, at this critical time, trade and investment must act as important engines of growth, productivity, innovation, job creation, development and poverty reduction to contribute to laying the foundation for a global economic recovery that leads to sustainable, balanced and inclusive growth. That could have been perhaps a shorter sentence, but these are welcome and inspiring words from the G20 trade ministers. They highlight both the importance of trade and investment, resilience and recovery in the pandemic, the Build Back Better agenda that Ho Lim has just spoken about, as well as the need for trade and investment to contribute to addressing climate breakdown, 
the unsustainable levels of inequality of power that plague markets and under, undermine public confidence and support, as Jean Yves has just said. The collapse of public trust in global markets has been sustained since the global economic crisis, and the danger must be that it will be reinforced by the economic impact of the pandemic. Many publics around the world do not feel and do not speak of our times as the golden age of globalization. Rather, they associate global markets presently with inequality, precarious employment, stagnant wages, climate breakdown, and rootless corporations. Responsible politicians of left and right are struggling to find ways to demonstrate to voters that global markets can deliver shared prosperity and shared security. Fortunately, they're joined by much of civil society, as well as an increasing number of more responsible companies and investors, as well as, of course, the multilateral institutions. Our organization, the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, works with all these actors to build transparency on corporate behavior regarding international standards for human rights, provides research and analysis that includes things such as corporate human rights benchmarks. We also take up over, uh, over 650 allegations of human rights abuse each year from companies, help seek redress when things go wrong in their operations and their supply chains. The reality revealed by our benchmarks is that the vast majority of even the largest companies in the high, and even in the highest risk sectors, such as mining, apparel, agriculture, ICT manufacture, it failed to meet even the essential uh, international United Nations standards of due diligence and duty of care, the workers and communities that they depend on. Our benchmarks use the international standards set out in the UN guiding principles for uh, business and human rights, agreed by the consensus of the United Nations 10 years ago, and the OECD due diligence guidelines and the ILO conventions. In essence, these, these state that companies have a clear responsibility to identify the salient risks to workers and communities in their operations and their supply chains to take action to mitigate these risks. Our latest human rights uh, benchmark from uh, nine months ago, which we prepared with investors like Aviva, APG, Nordea Bank, as well as the Institute for Human Rights uh, Business, this reveals that the breach that continues to exist between these international legal standards and the actions of most companies remains. The benchmark highlights responsible companies, of course, that are successfully respecting human rights in their operations and supply chains. Unfortunately, these represent only a small cluster of the 150 companies that we measured. For instance, a full 50% of the companies scored zero on every single indicator for human rights due diligence in their operations and supply chain. It is this glacial progress, progress by the majority of companies on their human rights responsibilities is spurring public concern and politicians' appetite, binding regulation and business incentives to direct companies away from short-termism and towards greater care, workers, communities and the environment. Unfortunately, the consequences of corporate negligence have been exacerbated by the pandemic. To give you just one instance, the global apparel supply chains that we monitor, we've seen many tens of millions of workers, mainly women, summarily dismissed from factories in Bangladesh, Cambodia, Myanmar, Mexico, without pay for their previous months of work, leaving them and their families facing destitution. This is not inevitable or necessary. Small leading group of mostly uh, of, of the most responsible public facing brands did not invoke force majeure articles in their contracts at the time of the pandemic, the lockdowns. And the following group recognized the massive reputation risk that they were creating for themselves have reformed over the summer and are now seeking to repay the wages for the goods that they took possession of but did not pay for. These companies remain, unfortunately, a minority tens of millions of workers remain without wages. That's just one experience in one sector. Faced with this type of behavior in the, in the supply chains of international business, publics are demanding greater effort by politicians 
ensure companies demonstrate reasonable care and protection for their livelihoods, their freedoms, and their dignity. Trade and investment rules, especially around social and environmental concerns, are clear that any measures must be no more trade distorting than is necessary. Alongside that principle, pressures for adequate regulation to direct markets away from the primacy of short-term return to shareholders is growing rapidly. The rise and rise of ESG investors demonstrates that even investors now are concerned about unsustainable inequality in markets and climate breakdown. Most far-sighted government companies and investors are looking to the right forms of business incentive and regulation to reform current business models. Up to now, this has consisted of mandatory transparency rules, such as the European Union's non-financial disclosure initiative and modern slavery acts in UK or Australia. The evidence that we and allies have accumulated points to the, the impacts of these efforts on mandatory transparency have had little effect on corporate behavior, except in those genuinely that leadership group want to do something about it. It is for this reason that there is now a growing movement, especially in the European Union, to introduce mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence laws. This is part of the legislation promised in 2021 under the Sustainable Corporate Governance Initiative in Europe. This would effectively seek to change the calculus of risk by corporate legal counsel and the boardrooms of companies that seek to externalize their environmental and human rights costs through ignoring pollution and human rights abuse in their operations and supply chains. These more reckless companies would now face effectively liability for these harms in a Euro European court if they could not show that they had taken care to identify the salient risks and address them. I'll give you one example. Investments in Myanmar. Elinor was one of the first companies to go into, uh, to enter Myanmar after the US embargo was lifted. Knowing that they were investing in a, in a country with very high human rights risks, Telenor developed a rigorous due diligence plan, an integral part of their business investment plan. It has served them very well ever since and avoided entanglements with the genocidal operations, for instance, of 2018. Contrast this with the approach of Facebook, described by the UN mission to investigate the genocidal acts against the Rohingya as a useful instrument for those seeking to spread hate in a context where, for most users, Facebook is the internet. The response of Facebook has been slow and ineffective. So these two examples illustrate why an increasing number of more responsible investors and businesses are calling for mandatory human rights due diligence in the European Union. They want the benefits of a level playing field, harmonization of standards, and legal certainty. They also want to end the unnecessary abuse by reckless competitors, that often create reputation risk and harm to re responsible companies in the same sector through broad association in the public mind. No regulation will be effective without li liability at its core. We only have to see the impact of the US Foreign Corrupt Practices Act to see that poor, poorer performing companies respond to genuine financial risk. Leading companies recognize this and they now accept this will be part of the European initiative. And European companies will rightly not accept being put at a competitive disadvantage from unscrupulous non-European competitors in Europe. So it is almost inevitable that the new EU due diligence obligations will become condition for access to the European market, requiring operators to demonstrate that their products have, that they place in the European market are in conformity with environmental and human rights criteria. Equally, the calls now for the European Union to adopt complementary trade measures, similar to those, for instance, of the existing Tariff Act in the United States, places an import ban on products suspected of being produced with egregious human rights abuse such as child or forced labor. Recent bans, <coughs> excuse me, the recent bans imposed by the US Customs and Border Patrol on rubber gloves made by workers in forced labor in Malaysia are already transforming, transforming that whole supply chain. The manufacturers rapidly ending debt bondage in their factories 
one company, uh, one affected company has already promised to repay $10 million back to their workers. And action is already being taken by unscrupulous competitors. Do the same in anticipation of similar action by the Customs and Borders Patrol. But it gives you an indication of how powerful that can be. In summary, the question for this session has been, are there solutions for the most pressing challenges of the 21st century? I, and I think Jan Eves, as well as Holim, have really tried to set out the new approaches that are, are built, also under serious consideration, which relate to trade and investment. The tragedy of the pandemic has brought great challenges. And the recovery of the pandemic creates main, many opportunities to tackle the quin, quin crises of unsustainable inequality in markets and climate breakdown. To seize these opportunities, we'll have to be bold in resetting multilateral and regional rules. Fortunately, there is a growing consensus, I believe, amongst politicians, responsible investors and companies, civil society and publics. These set out the key acupuncture points that can transform corporate behaviour, deliver shared prosperity and shared security. Both are going to be vital to the stability of the 21st century, as well as the dignities and freedoms of those who will live through that period. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, interesting turn, I think, of the discussion uh, as well. Kind of a nice compliment to what John Eves kind of started talking about, um, where she talked about the inequality among countries. Um, you're starting to cast light on the importance of of corporations and their the the role they they play in the growing in inequality within segments of populations. You know, undermining the political power of civil society. You know, I think touched on touched on a few interesting points, like the. The poor human rights uh, uh, record that, uh, or poor human rights due diligence and corporate behavior with respect to supply chains, um, how the pandemic has exacerbated poor corporate behavior, um, which I see as kind of a strain on profitability, makes it more costly for responsible behavior, um, but also some optimism that the utilization of trade restrictions, trade um, uh, uh, regulations uh, might be an instrument that could be used to kind of promote better corporate behavior. Um, uh, so thank you for that. I think it's a nice, uh, a nice compliment to kind of round out the conversation on the panel. So thank. Um, uh, we're now turning to the the question and answer period of the panel. Um, um, I brought it up. Uh, uh, no questions yet from the audience, but hopefully you can compose one in your mind um, uh, uh, and then write it down. Hopefully, so I can so I can uh, ask the panelists. Um, we can go a little bit past 12 to, uh, well, I'm saying 2.30 for me, we can go a little bit past uh, uh, 11, what, 12.30 for you all. Did I get that right? I'm, I'm having trouble doing math while I'm talking. Um, so yeah, we could, uh, as far as one o'clock. So if there becomes a robust discussion, we'll certainly be able to engage it. Um, in the meantime, let me maybe pose uh, the first question. Um, and I can pose it maybe generally and, and whoever wants to take it on um, uh, uh, can do so. Uh, so I guess what I've been thinking of uh, uh, through all three of the panelists is, um, you know, how whether it's in the greening of trade and economies, which which I believe is kind of a costly activity, um, certainly more costly to have more envi environmentally friendly behaviors, environmentally friendly uh, um, production of energy, electricity um, uh, than, than not. Um, you know, for John Eves, the the there's kind of a costliness involved for for large countries, in their support for small countries, uh, um, uh, and 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 for Phil uh, in the context of corporations. Um, you know, part of I think why we see this 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 behavior of, of corporations anytime, but certainly in the time of a pandemic, is it's is the bottom line. It's it's cheaper to uh, uh, treat uh, workers, um, you know, without without a full respect for their rights. Um, so I guess for all three, in, in the context of a pandemic where the bottom line, whether it's for countries, large or small, is under strain or for corporations, um, when there's economic stress, how do we absorb these more costly uh, behaviors uh, to kind of build back better, whether it's in the form of, of greening of the world or the form of um, promoting small countries' rights and in, in, in behavior or, or, in the, in the number, or in terms of worker rights? Um, so to me, it seems kind of a, it, it, there's an opportunity there, but how do we kind of accept the costliness of these, these kind of better activities for the world? 
uh, than the current current environment. I don't know if anyone wants to take on that question or 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 expand the conversation a little more in that direction. I'll, I'll start so that I can okay, get sorry. it all, and the others can kind of expand on what on, on my um, on my initial remarks. Then that's a really good question, but I think it actually is short-sighted short to think of it in terms of immediate costliness. And I can certainly imagine that um, both Phil and Holim will say that you absorb the, the shorter term costs to attain outcomes that will have longer term sustainable outcomes. Um, and I can certainly think about that in the context of the specific remarks I made on small states. It's, and I think it's less a question for small states about costs there is a finite uh, amount of resources available made by donor countries, um, as well as IFIs. And the question really is, how do you allocate these resources? And the, the traditional measure that was undertaken from the Bretton Woods times, which was accepted to be flawed when it was adopted, this GDP per capita as a basis for allocating financing and confessional funding, um, has to be revisited. And, and I'll explain why, because a country may be doing very well, but as a result of one exogenous shock in the Caribbean and other places as well, I mean, we talk about small states, but they're not just in the Caribbean, they're in the Pacific. They're also countries that are very large, um, but LDCs, for instance, have very chronic issues. So I'm talking about vulnerability writ large. Um, but for some of these vulnerabilities, they are inherent. And so the question is, when you think of a one single catastrophic, catastrophic event that happened, for instance, to Dominica, or in the case of Vanuatu, or in the Bahamas, it wipes out entire economies, and it takes time to rebuild. So there is a pool of financing. The question is, what measures do you use? Do you use all GDP per capita that, yes, says that countries have been doing well traditionally since they entered the multilateral scene, but as a result of one event, a pandemic, your entire economy is decimated, your existence is threatened. What is a better, fairer, in the context of a trade response, measure of how these countries can build back resilience? Do you go to GDP per capita, which has been the traditional way of looking at it, or do you think of complementing that um, using new tools that really measure sectoral countrywide vulnerabilities? That's the first thing. So I would say, less for me a question, at least as insofar as it's affecting small states, of an added cost. It's doing smarter in identifying how to um, gauge the solutions. And then the second point is that some of the issues that we have been raising, blacklisting, have nothing to do with costs, really. In fact, they impose costs on us because as a result of blacklisting, you're no longer favored for investments, and there can be some kind of sanctions imposed. And the question is not so much, I think what is being raised is the process. There, there may be an uh, avenue for having more fruitful discussions that are open to countries that are being impacted discriminately um, by some of these policies that larger countries take. So I think it's a good question, but I think as applied to the specific problems that we are facing, it's less a question of cost, it's more a question of acceptance acceptance that the old ways of responding to countries' concerns need to be revisited. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Ho, I think you're, actually, we'll get all three answers. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Phil, you, you raised your hand first, actually. Would you like to jump in, Phil? No, okay. no you know, Brian, I think you, you, you know, really asked a very good question, because this is, this is the sort of question we get all the time, you know, I think on many different things. But I think, Jean-Yves already answered quite a lot of it, you know. But let's start firstly with costs. Do we actually fully really calculate costs properly today? And, and this is a, is a traditional environmental economics challenge, is that the costs of a particular action is often not fully uh, taken into account. So all the externalities that arise from whether we uh, continue to pollute, uh, whether we, you know, try to use up all natural resources, uh, create so much more costs than the cost of action. So in other words, what I'm saying is that the cost of inaction is much higher than the cost of action. And, and why people look at costs as if it's very costly is because they forget about all of the other costs that are related 
to that particular action, which are basically all the externalities. Don't want to keep coming to COVID-19, but it's such a, a tempting thing to, to jump on, is to say that, you know, the, the costs created by COVID-19, you know, stopping economies worldwide is huge. Um, at the same time, uh, I'm sure there were, I'm not one of these experts, but I'm sure there were many experts talking about things that had to be done uh, in order to, pre to prevent such a pandemic happening. And I'm pretty sure that when those experts were putting forth their views, they were told the same thing, it's too costly. Uh, it's too costly to do all of these things that you're talking about. But look at the cost today uh, of, of not addressing the risks of pandemic. So I think it's the same sort of calculus that uh, we need to get you know, somehow away from. Uh, the cost of not addressing environmental risks. I'm not an environmentalist, by the way. I work for the WTO. Uh, but you know, I hear a lot from environmental groups. And I think you know, there, there is sense to, to some of these you know, uh, thinking. I mean, that you do need to address you know, um, the costs that come out from inaction you know, and, and think about uh, that type of uh, dimension. And that would be much, much bigger than the cost that you're talking about uh, in terms of investing in cleaner technology. But then even if we didn't want to take into account all of the externalities and we just want to look in terms of investment and have an internal rate of return that is very focused just on the investment, you can also ask questions there whether continually to pump money into certain types of activities are necessarily economically efficient. The trade world sees a lot of that. We see a lot of governments continually pumping subsidies. I won't mention countries, I won't mention sectors, but they do that. They pump very costly subsidies into things for which they get very little return on. Uh, and that's nothing to do with sustainability or environment. It's purely a, a political calculation as to where they want to direct their cost towards. And then in terms of some figures, you know, about what might be things that could be good in terms of, again, about, you know, uh, looking at this cost I mentioned, the Global Green Growth Institute says that uh, in their report that a $1 million investment uh, would generate around 7.5 full-time jobs in renewable energy infrastructure um, and about 7.7 .7 full-time jobs in energy efficiency as compared to the same investment going into fossil fuel uh, and fossil fuel would only generate about 2.6 full-time jobs. I, I'm neither advocating investment in fossil fuel or investment in renewable energy, but I think if we want to talk costs, we need to look at these figures very in very sort of um, in a very empirical way and, and to make that calculation. So it's a very difficult thing to say just generally, but these are some, again, ways to, to look at the question. Thank you. Great, thanks, I appreciate the answer. Phil. Thanks, Brian. And again, uh, like the other two, I think it's a great question because it's one that comes up all the time. And I think it's, a, it's, you know, it's so fundamental. From, from from our perspective, first of all, just look at the performance of ESG portfolios. Uh, firstly, ESG portfolios are generally outperforming non-ESG portfolios uh, on the stock exchanges. They oddly they're doing it long term, which you would expect because they've got much more resilience built into them, much less volatility. They're even doing it short term uh, now, which is uh, extraordinary, and through the pandemic. So. I think in terms of the costs that are being absorbed, actually more reckless companies are having to absorb more costs at the moment. Otherwise, how would we explain that performance in the in the returns on the uh, uh, stock exchanges? So, so from that perspective, there must be something going on in terms of the extraordinary levels of volatility that companies are having to absorb. And there's ways in which they're building resilience in their own operations and their supply chain. And I think the second thing I'd say is, you know, just as uh, Leo Lim said, for instance, the, the regulatory framework has to now demand that there is a greater internalization of costs that have otherwise been simply externalized by, by companies. You know, you mentioned earlier, I think, the issue of plastics. I mean, these have just been, you know, creating <laughs> extraordinary 
scale of, of plastic waste without any cost being built into it in terms of disposing of that, of that waste. It's somebody else's responsibility, i.e. it comes back to the taxpayers. I think taxpayers are in revolt and saying, hang on, you know, the, these companies need to look at how they're generating all these costs that we're now absorbing. Even worse, of course, in terms of climate change and the threats that are upon us all in terms of that area. So that's another uh, area just where that regulatory reform is going to and already is impinging directly on the, on these issues of costs. The, the other thing I just wanted to highlight was the issue of you know, the, um, in terms of, if you look at the area that I mentioned, the, the apparel sector, you know, the purchasing practices in the apparel sector are such that they drive uh, irresponsible behaviour by, by manufacturers who have to meet extraordinarily uh, low cost production, often with very short timeline. Um, many of the fast fashion brands that to speak to more even the more responsible the ones let alone the high performance agree that actually then with, with an adequate regulatory framework they would make just as much money and they would create many more jobs potentially if there was a some kind of framework that would stop that race to the bottom and there have been efforts even by the fast fashion industry itself with manufacturers and trade unions try and address that in a voluntary fashion what we really need is the man is the regulator finally i'd just say to give you one another key example of this what we see in say the extractive sector or in now the renewable energy sector unfortunately is that those companies that build in human rights due diligence environmental due diligence to avoid Necessary harms in their investments generally have an excellent relationship with the communities, strong relationship with the workers and their organizations, and make good money out of those investments. Unfortunately, many of those that do not follow that essential due diligence find themselves with, with extraordinary levels of resistance, community. community uh, action to suspend their operations and ballooning costs around that irresponsible approach to investors to their own investment so that's and uh, that, so even in the areas such as renewable energy we need to find the ways in which the investors and the companies involved in that, that sector as it opens up are really thinking upstream about how they avoid those extraordinary us to the workers and communities whose rights are abused because their land is taken without compensation, etc. Equally, the cost back to the business because there will be suspensions, there will be uh, looming costs attached to the extraordinary costs of losing your social license to operate. So that would be my an my answer back, and I think there's lots of evidence to that uh, back those up. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um... Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess just to oversimplify, it's it's the 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 answer to the question is maybe the myopia of how we evaluate cost um, uh, and properly accounting for um, slightly longer term uh, cost in the short term, the the range of externalities, et cetera. I mean, I think to one degree or another, that's the answers from all three of you kind of touched on that. We have two questions from the crowd, um, and so. Um, while I'll pose them generally, I think they're both a little more directed towards Ho, but I think any, any all, all three of you could have a different perspective on them. The first question um, is bearing in mind the numerous calls for a green economic rebuild and the response thus far of the G20, in your view, has COVID-19 accelerated or decelerated the move to a green economic future? So, you know, really the questions about, I suppose, um, yeah, has COVID-19 slow down this greening of the economy that we've we've hoped to be seeing um or is it is it actually helping to accelerate it um who do you want to take it or does anyone else have a have an insight that they want to share on this this particular question okay i can, I can just jump in quickly on this I, I i think it's it's a mixed picture i think that's the best that i can offer really i i think that you know it's on, on the one hand, you, you do get um, people more mobilized and people are more 
aware of some of these challenges and the need to address them. And, and you do see that, I think, at least we do see it. We see that there has been uh, a greater um, wish to engage and a wish to get into looking at how trade, for instance, could be working better for the environment. Uh, on the other hand, there's also challenges as what I began with is that um, um, it, it depends on how governments respond in a way is do they respond uh, with uh, heavy capital injection into sectors uh, that are not very good for sustainability because they believe this is a back to your question, Brian, the, the short term, that in the short term, they need to do these things uh, to keep uh, jobs afloat. That's a potential negative. In some areas of the environment, it's from what we know, it's um, very challenged at the moment in terms of plastics pollution. Many countries were moving ahead on single use plastics uh, related legislation. Um, yet the need for PPE and different types of uh, plastics protect, protective uh, equipment has increased the use of uh, single use plastics. Um, so that there's a clear health need, but there's also this environmental challenge. Um, things like um, even packaging, I think somebody touched upon this as well, um, uh, may well have gone up. I, I don't have figures, but the, intuitively, you know, you might find packaging may have gone up uh, and this will be another challenge. Um, transportation in the, in the meantime seems to have gone down and some people say this is uh, potentially um, a, a plus. Uh, but we know from previous crises that um, emission rates go up very quickly uh, uh, thereafter. And also we need to ask why have things gone down? I mean, if things have gone down um, due to a pandemic that leads to people losing their jobs um, may not be such a good thing. So I don't have a, a clear picture about to say that it's a mix of things, but I think what's more important is to think about what are the policies going forward? You know, um, and and is there a drive uh, towards these uh, differences in policies going forward? Okay, thanks for that. Um, Phil, did you know, go ahead, Phil. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's also, you know, it's a great question, I think, um, and one that we have to really think hard about. I think the, again, uh, you know, I, I agree very much with the uh, whole limb that it's a mixed picture. Um, I think, first of all, if you look at the way in which the, uh, if you look at the behaviour of the stock market at the moment, some of the key things there again is that this has not affected ESG portfolios. Um, they've actually grown significantly during this period. And so the, the, the investor appetite insists that environmental and social costs are incorporated by companies has has continued i think equally if you look at things like for instance the um international accounting standards board has released such an important new accounting standard this summer which has changed fundamentally the way in which the books of bp and shell have been developed writing down significant amounts of what they perceived as their assets because now they're toxic assets these things are, are, are significant changes that have continued throughout uh, this period of, of, of coping with the pandemic so there are uh, equally at the european union uh, i think there's been an uh, you know there's been a clear acceleration of absorption of, of environmental issues green issues as well as social issues into the recovery plan and that's uh, and it's not slowed Kind of things that I was talking about in terms of sustainable finance initiative, in terms of the, um, in terms of the mandatory human rights due diligence legislation, etc. So those things have not been affected. I think where we've got a major issue, and uh, Holim uh, uh, touched on this, is the issue of the bailout. Um, and I think there, there's been a massive missed opportunity, which I hope we can address in the future. With the bailouts that the in northern uh, in uh, richer countries, been no transparency really about who has been receiving the bailouts. I think equally, no real effort, as far as I can see, on conditionality regarding those bailouts. And this was a massive opportunity 
make sure the companies that were really in need of those bailouts got a level of minimum conditions. Any company who's going to receive from the bank a significant amount of money knows that there's going to be conditionalities accepted uh, uh, attached to it. It's, it, isn't, it isn't unusual for companies. It's bog standard uh, um, uh, practice. And there could have been, for instance, the need for anybody receiving a bailout to really have, for instance, you know, a clear time-bound plan to meet their own company's targets regarding the Paris Agreement. There could also have been clear, the need for a clear time-bound plan to put in due diligence, uh, minimum due diligence practice in their company. So I'm still hopeful that 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 can happen over this over this next period because there's no reason why again in these crises we need we need to back companies that need that money because of the jobs crisis that there that should not be without any conditionality at all regarding the agenda of build back better holin was speaking about earlier we need these companies to behave differently in the future to what they're behaving what they have been behaving in the past particularly regarding social and environmental issues. Okay, I think that's actually a nice segue into the next question. Um, a slightly different wrinkle on, on, on what you were, your answer was. So the, the next question is, please discuss the compatibility with the WTO of making trade preferences or trade restrictions conditional on compliance with commitments made under the UNFCCC Paris Climate Agreement. So in other words, um, can these commitments be enforced through trade measures? Anyone have a view on that? I mean, I, I think if I may just hazard a, a sort of a reaction to that, um, and, and it would be brief, is that I think in the trade community, I'm no longer in Geneva, so I, I stand corrected. As far as I can see, the discussion about climate obligations those emerging under the UNFCC and elsewhere is still very much, um, I would say, a side issue. I'm not sure that it has been frontally addressed through sort of more purposeful discussion about how to accommodate um, and marry countries' differing obligations. And so the way you see it coming up defensively, um, at least when I survey the scene, is, is, is in the context of disputes. And the one dispute I have in mind is the India Solar Panel case where again, because there's very little frontal treatment of the issue, it comes up in the context of a country, in that case, um, seeking to justify a measure on the basis of uh, national uh, sort of um, approaches it had taken to comply with UNFCC obligations. Um, and it being dealt with by a dispute settlement body in the context of Article 20 exceptions. Um, now, in that case, specifically, India did not prevail because of technicalities relating to the fact that the UNFCC obligations did not have direct effect, and so it couldn't avail itself of the exception under subparagraph D. But I think what it does is raises a broader question of how countries are going to try to accommodate their varying obligations in a sustainable way, um, if it's seen very much as peripheral to core obligations under trade, it is doomed to be considered in that very, I would say, um, uh, unsatisfying way in the context of dispute settlement. And the question for me is not even so much when that discussion will be brought full scale in the WTO because of the negotiating malaise we have currently, that's putting it uh, very kindly, but it's that it's having a constraining effect from what I can see on government policy. Um, countries and governments may feel uh, reluctant to march boldly into um, making policy that they think may have a trade impact um, because there's an absence of that fulsome discussion, whether it's taking place at the WTO or elsewhere, to try to marry these obligations. So the chilling effect it's having on government regulatory action and really being able to step boldly into complying with obligations under the UFCC or elsewhere is what to me is the problematic right now is that it's having that chilling effect because of the absence of a very conclusive comprehensive approach of countries absorbing their varying obligations in a way that is satisfying to them. 
So the marginal treatment of this issue um, is going to have that chilling effect because governments do not want to fall foul of their obligations under the WTO elsewhere. And so in the absence of the WTO taking this on um, as a bold issue that they're trying to, um, to deal with, whether it's through some kind of side agreement, whether it's through some sort of interpretation of how current obligations should be viewed, is really going to have an impact, I think, on countries' um, regulatory um, reaction um, in the field of their climate change obligations. Thanks. Uh, go ahead, Ho, and then we're, we'll have to wrap up after that. Yeah, I mean, Brian, I, I think this, again, is one of these very good questions. But, you know, I would like to turn this question around a little bit because uh, it starts with asking whether it's compliant with the WTO. I think one has to start also by asking, would it be in compliance with the UNFCCC's own convention and its own framework agreement? And, and here I can't recall the actual article, but there's an article there which basically says that trade measures should not be used. Um, to address climate change uh, objectives, actually. And it actually does go further about, um, about um, avoiding the use of unilateral measures. Um, so it, it would seem to be, I, I mean, we can always, of course, have a much deeper discussion, but it would seem to me that some of the challenges may actually arise within UNFCCC itself, even before you get to the WTO. Uh, and then the other question to ask is, Within the UNFCCC framework, there's the principle of common uh, but differentiated, differentiated responsibility. So when you ask the question of compliance, um, it's not a single benchmark as to what compliance actually means. Um, and you would need to also understand how would UNFCCC understand compliance? What would be compliance within the framework? Um, and how would you take into account common uh, but differentiated responsibility uh, within the UNFCCC framework. And then the, the other question to ask is that, you know, if you are linking it uh, to commitments, meaning the nationally determined contributions that members have taken or UNFCCC parties have taken, keep in mind that these are very broad um, uh, contributions, is nationally determined, is not the the sort of top-down approach from the Kyoto Protocol. It was each member, uh, each party would determine how they would meet these uh, uh, emission targets. And again, you're gonna have a variety of, uh, of uh, targets, a variety of commitments, um, and even within the UNFCCC process, and that's of course another discussion, uh, to what extent are these NDCs actually binding? Some say they are binding, but binding in a different way than the way we think about binding commitments uh, within the WTO. Uh, so I think you already have a whole range of questions to ask even before you get to WTO. Uh, and then you have the other question about, um, you know, how, well, I, I would even turn it around. Is it really necessary um, in, um, to, to go down to the WTO question um, and ask first, how do you resolve these issues within the UNFCCC? Um, but I'm John Eve, being a former appellate body secretariat member who's now been liberated from the WTO, may have more thoughts on this. You know. Great, thanks. And I think we'll have to wrap up there. Ho. Um, um, just this one final thought I'll have is is other than the this the work that I've done, other than the European Union, um, I don't think there's an instance of a of a country that has defined uh, objectives under the UN of the Paris Agreement, which they can't meet. So maybe the, the question would be, how do you motivate more ambitious objectives uh, uh, in order to actually make progress against the kind of the underlying goals of the agreement? Um, but maybe with that final thought, um, I'll just say thank you to all three panelists uh, for a fascinating discussion, um, three excellent uh, presentations, um, and uh, pass it on to Jalinda to wrap up the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian, and thank you to all three panelists. This was really an excellent um, end of the conference. So uh, thank you also very much to all participants for remaining with us until the end, and to all speakers and chairs for taking time to share their insights and expertise with us. It has been two very exciting days of presentations and discussions um, broadly on themes around the future of international trade law. Um, summarizing, um, I would um, identify five themes that uh, were 
discussed, but also uh, referred to in, in the different panels. First, is multilateralism sustainable as a global governance model uh, in the form that it was conceived in the Bretton Woods system? So the Geneva and the Washington panels um, address this, um, including in relation to the dispute settlement system, um, also taken in the Hong Kong and Singapore uh, panel. Second, how can challenges be dealt with and um, as a first step, can we identify a principled system that could serve as a basis for this? Multiple references were made to the rule of law in the keynote speech by Sir Francis Jacobs and uh, in the different panels, including in the London panel. Third, the attempts to regulate new sectors, trade and technology and the digital technology, the Shanghai and Beijing panel uh, covered this this morning. Fourth, panels also made the point about the close relationship between trade and other areas, especially in this last panel, environment, climate change, creating opportunities for small states to ensure um, the commitment of the SDGs to leave no one behind, which is also the theme of the G20 summit meeting, realizing opportunities for all in the 21st century. Also, what role businesses and the private sector can play in, in creating more equal playing field, uh, equal uh, playing trade field uh, in informed by sustainability and fairness, rather than citing you, Brian, the myopic returns approach. And finally, uh, fifth theme, um, uh, a cross-cutting theme was that of the role and limits of legal instruments in dealing with some of these challenges. Are there other types of collaborations that are more effective and maybe more suitable in this moment or um, more suitable in relation to some more sensitive topics? So with these challenging questions in mind, we'll go back to our own research, legal work as practitioners, lawyers, policymakers, and we hope to have addressed some of the topical uh, academic and practical issues, um, exploring emerging ideas and maybe suggested some answers. We look forward to seeing you again next year and hopefully before that in the context of more activities of this kind uh, organized and convened by um, the British Institute of International and Comparative Law. Thank you again on behalf of Bickel and from me personally, uh, to all participants, the chairs, the speakers, to our sponsors, uh, Mayor Brown and Van Bellenbellis, and to my colleagues from the events team who made all this possible. Thank you and goodbye.